Hello and welcome everybody to our special live stream program, our noon lunchtime discovery series brought to you this week by BugFest at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the Office of Environmental Education out of the Department of Environmental Quality. Welcome everybody to the show. My name is Chris Smith. I will be your host today for our noontime program. Of course, I'm your host every Wednesday at noon for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. This week though, we're doing things a little bit more special than we normally do because at the museum, all week long through Saturday, we are celebrating Bugfest. Now, if you're a fan of the museum, you know that Bugfest is our one day, 35,000 person strong celebration of all things arthropod, but we couldn't throw a big party at the museum so we're throwing an enormous six day virtual party. All week long, we're featuring special guest speakers, virtual crafts, uh, watching movies. The, there's so many cool things happening this week. I can't even remember them all right now. More than 50 programs are happening all week long. Go to bugfest.org in order to see what's happening in these programs all over. Uh, lots of cool stuff. You don't want to miss it. This lunchtime discovery series, though, we have we brought in a, a very special guest, a presentation that I'm excited to hear and learn more about. Uh, Perry Hurt is an art conservator at the North Carolina Museum of Art, and I am very excited to figure out how art conservation features in Bugfest. Perry, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are things in your part of North Carolina? Very nice, very nice. My uh, home office here is suiting me well today, so I think I'm ready to talk to everybody. Hello to everybody out there in virtual land. Hope you're doing well. Uh, as Chris just said, I'm a painting conservator at the North Carolina Museum of Art, and um, my job is to preserve art and to uh, uh, restore it if necessary, and, and actually bugs do come into that a little bit. But uh, to tell you the truth, in my day-to-day -day world, I don't think about bugs very often. I have mosquitoes in my backyard that irritate me, and every once in a while a cockroach uh, rears its antennae near my house. But uh, other than that, I don't think about bugs very often. So it was really fun to uh, get this invitation to talk for Bug Fest and to dive into a little bug and art research myself. And I, I learned quite a few things, and I hope everybody will be educated and entertained today by my talk. And maybe there'll be a few surprises. We'll just see. So shall we launch into it? I'm definitely looking forward to it. I think this is going to be exciting. Take okay, it away. I'm going to share my screen here. I think maybe you have to share my screen. I'm going to put my PowerPoint up. And you tell me if you can see it. Whoops. Um, share screen. That's me. Here we go. Share screen. There we go. No? Share screen? Let's see. We're almost there. We're looking at your uh, your desktop. Okay, let's see. So, so I've got a web browser up. Stop share. Let me share again. Whoops, there it goes. I'm sorry. There we go. Now I've got it. Sorry, technical difficulties. How's that look? Are we Excellent. there? Okay. And we're now into the slideshow, and then we're good. Very good. Now I'm gonna let's see. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not getting the view where I can actually see it. I can see my PowerPoint, but I, I'm not seeing what I'm sharing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and talk. Um, you, go, uh, you go ahead and get started. I'll pull it up for you. Okay, sounds good. From the beginning, here we go. Sorry. Perfect, there we are. There we go, okay, very good. Uh, nice. And I'm gonna put my speaker thing out of the way because I don't, I don't wanna see me, there you go. <laughs> okay, so bugs and art, here we go. We've already done this part, so we're gonna move on to the next one. Um, so the more I thought about bugs and art, uh, the more I thought about, well, we're surrounded by bugs. And I think this uh, 13th century Chinese painting really illustrates that very well. It's some beautiful bugs here, a lot of variety. And everywhere you look on this painting, there's a bug hiding in there or not hiding. And um, I thought about this a lot, and uh, I started doing my research into bugs and art, and I kind of found out that bugs are almost everywhere in art in so many different ways. 
And in fact, I had to work a little bit just to find an artwork that did not have anything to do with bugs. Uh, so my next slide, I'm gonna ask the viewers to help me out here a little bit. Here we go. I want the viewers to tell me which one of these artworks that is bug free. That is, which one of these artworks has nothing to do with bugs as far as we know. So I'll, get, I'll let you think about that for a second. We have 10 artworks up here, various times and places and media. And you will notice that I believe five of them have a little NCMA next to them in yellow. And that in illustrates that this artwork is in the collection of the North Carolina Museum of Art. I'm gonna be showing you a lot of artwork today. And I would say about half of it is from our collection. And so I hope you come and visit us. We're back open to the public and I hope you can come visit us. So uh, if you have a, a thought about which one of these might not be bug related, uh, you can hit the chat there and uh, Chris will tell me if we have anybody that's responded. Yeah, folks, so uh, over there in the chat on YouTube, let yeah. us know what you think. Uh, you can sort of just post this sort of the general look or location of it there on the slide and I'll, I'll relay that information back. But Perry, I'm wondering if I can take a stab at this one. Sure, Chris, I mean, what do you think? So my, let's see, which one does not have to do with insects? I'm gonna say this um, multicolored quilt like patchwork in the top right. That would be a great guess, but incorrect. That, that is a early American, early Native American uh, textile that we will talk about later. All of these uh, uh, images up here, except for the bug free one I'll be talking about during my talk. And we will definitely talk about that textile later in the talk. All right, so we got lots of people in the chat now. Okay, <laughs> I've, got, I've got two votes for the statue, the lady. Statue I've got okay. several votes for the, the Dali painting. Okay, okay. And then I've got one vote for an incense burner. Incense burner, okay. Unfortunately, all those are incorrect. There's oh. only one here that is not bug related and it happens to be the black and white drawing or painting that's just to the right of the center of the screen. This are, these looks like insects, that's why I chose it, but these are actually boats. These are, this is a painting of boats by Cy Twombly from about 30, 40 years ago. And it has absolutely nothing to do with bugs as far as I know. So that leaves us the other 10 artworks to talk about. Here we go. Fascinating. Okay, inspiring bugs. So we're really talking about the history of bugs and art here. And the earliest art that I know of that I've come across happens to be this uh, large wall painting, uh, Aboriginal, uh, excuse me, Aboriginal wall painting in Western Australia. And the sharp viewers out there will already recognize that we're uh, looking at a honeycomb here, bee honeycomb. Uh, very interesting. It seems that all of the early references to insects that we know of are about bees. And for good reason, everybody loves honey. There aren't many natural sources of, of, of sugar, straight sugar, uh, in the natural environment. So of course, humans are really drawn to honey. Uh, the ancient Egyptians were very enamored of honey. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the bee was the symbol of Lower Egypt, that area of, of the Delta region of the Nile is Lower Egypt. And you see it in quite a few of their artworks. In fact, you see it in their writing as well. In hieroglyphs, you will see the bee glyph uh, quite often, but only in, generally only speaking, in royal inscriptions. And I think that that says something about their reverence for, for bees. We move on, oh, staying with ancient Egypt, uh, the, the scarab is quite frequently seen in ancient Egyptian art. And we see it here on the head of the coffin of Amun Red at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And so why do we see it there? Well, the, the Egyptians saw the scarab as a symbol of immortality, resurrection, transformation, and protection. And they got this from observing scarab, that is a dung beetle, uh, in real life. The dung beetles roll around these dung balls, which they consume, but they also lay eggs in it and feed their young. So this represented a cycle of rebirth for the Egyptians. And if you look at the top of the screen on the detail of the flying scarab from our coffin, if you look down at its feet, there's a little tiny ball down there. So we actually have the dung ball in the picture as well. On the right, staying in, off, in, in Africa, we have uh, two insect-shaped weights. These are relatively small, about an inch long or less. And these were weights that were used on a scale to weigh gold. 
um, and they're very they're very specific as far as what they weigh, but they're very nicely formed, very naturalistically formed as insects. And I put in a little uh, 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 tooth for the uh, art museum. The lower bug, the beetle there, is actually at the art museum now. These two insect weights are part of the Smithsonian African Art Collection. But currently we have an exhibition called Good as Gold at the North Carolina Museum of Art through December that I know everybody will love, especially insect lovers. Moving on, we have uh, some ancient art from the Americas. Here's our incense burner. That was one of the votes early on. And if you look closely at this incense burner right above the head, the head in the center there, right above that, there are three butterflies depicted there. In ancient American cultures, the life cycle, bright colors, and the soaring flight of butterflies uh, was seen by Americans, uh, ancient Americans as significant, a, a symbol of renewal, transformation, fire, war, death, was very important. And you see it in a lot of early American art. Um, the bowl at the lower right there is a Southwestern Native American bowl, a Zuni bowl. And if you look at the lower right corner of that bowl, you'll see something that looks like a stick pin with a couple of lines across it. And that's actually a diagram for a dragonfly. And dragonflies were, were, were very highly thought of in Native American culture. They were seen as insightful, uh, seen through illusions, and a sign of good fortune. A fly on the wall. Uh, this is a, a great saying that we hear every once in a while, you know, a fly sitting on the wall observing what we are doing. And it's interesting because in a lot of early European paintings, you have the artist painting a very illusionistic fly on a painting. So if you look at the left here, we see a painting from the 15th century and the fly is actually down on the very bottom there on the edge of this trompe frame. And you see the detail of it there. And then on the far right, once again, we have a incredibly well-painted fly that's on the headdress of this woman at the upper left. And in the lower section here, we have a very large painting at the Rijksmuseum, and it may be hard to see the fly, but the fly is actually painted on the water section at the lower right between the boat and the shore there. And it's, it's actually painted much larger than the people would be. It's, it's, it's painted in the size that someone observing this painting would actually see. So what, is, what does the fly mean? Well, a lot of art historians see this as a symbol, especially on early uh, Christian paintings or, or paintings that, that might have a Christian connotation. The fly was seen maybe as, as a, an image of Satan, uh, a, an evil thing. The Lord of the Flies, Satan was called. So in a lot of ways, it could have this religious connotation. It could also be a symbol that's referring to the mortality of people, uh, 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 memento mori is what they call it. Could be that. But the other thing it's probably is, in more cases than not, it's, it's just a sign of the virtuoso technique of the artists themselves. Being able to, to pick something that is so small and so intricate and do it accurately and make it look three-dimensional and real, what's really showing off the technique of the artist. We see that again a little bit later. This is a, a 17th century still lives, two of them that are at, at the North Carolina Museum of Art, the uh, Vanitas uh, still life by uh, Van Elst, and then also the basket of fruit by uh, Van der Est. Uh, these are fantastic paintings, and this is a very common theme in Netherlandish paintings right at the beginning of the 17th century. And why was that? Well, the Dutch were out colonizing the world and trading all over the world, and they were finding new things left and right, seashells, plants, insects, fruits they had never seen, spices, all sorts of crazy things that they were discovering out there. And it was also a time of scientific investigation. About this time, about 1600, um, the uh, microscope was invented, possibly in the Netherlands. And so there was a, just a lot of interest in science and, and these new discoveries. So what were the artists doing? The artists were painting, making objects that the public wanted to see. So they're doing these fantastic still lives, but with insects in them, because people want to see this. And once again, it's an opportunity to show off their fantastic technique of painting. They can make every surface, those leaves, the fruit, the insects themselves, all look as real as possible. When we get into modern art, of course, in, in today's art, we have some things like you see on the left-hand side of the screen, some fantastic art that's inspired by bugs. Um, beautiful things, but the insects themselves are beautiful. So why wouldn't we want to represent them in any other medium we can think of? So flower, actual flower parts, 
or, or in resin and glass and brass like the insect on the top there. But in a lot of instances, the artwork that we see, especially in the 20th century, kind of connects with the anxiety that we have about bugs. Um, surrealism from the early 20th century, the art movement surrealism itself was very much about anxiety and about uh, tapping into our dreams to, to kind of read into that anxiety. And Salvador Dali actually used ants in his artworks a great deal. You see a lot of ants in, in Salvador Dali's work. Uh, and, and he you know, himself commented on the fact that they tend to be attracted to decay in particular. So the, that's something that he was uh, definitely tapping into. But at the same time, he also had this to say, I have reached the conclusion that the ant is a superior being. So clearly he had positive thoughts about ants as well. And then in the center here, we have Louise Bourgeois, fantastic artist who passed away just about a, a decade ago. And the spider was one of her favorite uh, uh, subjects and she was quite famous for her spider uh, sculptures. For her, the spider is a very positive image. It's actually a surrogate for her mother and the feelings that she had that her mother protected her and the industry that her mother illustrated in, in her day-to-day -day work. Um, so it's, 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 the spider can be both a positive thing and a negative thing, of course, but here it's a very positive. So here's another facet altogether about bugs and art. And this is what I deal with on a relatively daily basis. So here are some of the insects that we do not like to see in a museum collection. Uh, at the top right, we have clothes moth. Uh, well, I think just about anybody's experienced that when you're with your clothes in your closet, all the mysterious little holes that come into them. Carpet beetles are very similar. Uh, both of these insects, it's not the adult insect that we're worried about. The adult insect generally doesn't have any interest in our clothes and our carpets other than to lay eggs. And it's the larva that comes out of those eggs that actually feasts on, uh, on protein, proteins like wool in particular. So they can be very destructive. Uh, as far as books goes, uh, a lot of librarians are familiar with book lice, a little ant-like creature that loves to tunnel through books, and also silverfish. We see silverfish just about everywhere. I've seen them in my own house. And once again, they can be very destructive. But a personal favorite in the conservation uh, painting world is the powder post beetle. Uh, here we see a couple of examples. You see the insect on the left, of course. When you look at the, an object, a wooden object uh, that has been uh, infested with a uh, powder post beetle, you see these holes on the surface. Generally, this is the only indication that you have that you have a problem. These holes are quite small, as you can see, compared to the tip of a pencil. But the problem is the in, that's just the entrance or exit hole for the insect. The insect goes into the wood, lays its eggs, and the larva feast on the inside of the, of the wooden artifact. And so you, you can see in this example of some paneling, some wooden paneling, the insects tunnel, the, the larva tunnel parallel to the grain, but they don't go to the surface. So they can almost totally hollow out a wooden object before you ever even know you have a problem. And, and of course, the object becomes very weak and very easy to collapse if you try to grasp it or, or put any force on it. Here's a couple of examples from the North Carolina Museum of Art. And I wanna say this insect happened, well, insect damage happened well before it came to the museum. We are extremely cognizant and careful about insects in the museum. We always are vigilant about getting on top of any insect problem that we might encounter. So. These two uh, cases happened before the museum, uh, before the artwork came to the museum. So here's our female saint by uh, Tillman Riemann Schneider on the right. And this is one of the sculptures that we saw at the very beginning was a couple of boats that had nothing to do with bugs. But unfortunately, it's had too much to do with bugs. You can see in the detail at the, at the bottom there, the holes, those are the entry and exit holes that we see on the outside of the sculpture. And the inside of the sculpture is probably relatively tunneled, hopefully, uh, Fortunately, it's still, the sculpture is still staying together quite well, but as you can see in the detail of the head, at the upper top of the crown there, about a quarter size area has actually been crushed because the tunneling inside has become uh, uh, progressive enough that it, that spot was weakened. So something touched that area, crushed the outside, and that's the result. On the painting you see on the left, this is kind of an interesting example. This is an, uh, we're seeing a detail of an x-ray of this panel painting. The panel itself is only about a quarter of an inch thick. So these tunnelings, the, the, the insects tunnel into the panel and through the panel, and you can't see these from the surface. Um, you only see entrance and exit holes, and sometimes they can be very small, but you can see that the tunneling can become 
quite uh, uh, robust and really damage an artwork. Oh, and my personal favorite, fly specs. Uh, this is the disgusting part of the talk. If anybody has a weak stomach out there, they may want to turn down the volume for a minute. Uh, people that are familiar with flies know how they eat, how they approach their food. They actually regurgitate on it, regurgitating their uh, digestive uh, materials onto the object, onto the food before they try to uh, eat it, before they try to swallow it. And this, you see a lot on artworks. I, I'd say that almost any painting of any age has at least a few fly specks on it. The detail that we see here is from a portrait that I treated long ago. And you can see that it was extremely uh, littered with fly specks. So all of the dark spots that you see here are fly specks, fly vomit on the face of this painting. And uh, the fly vomit itself is very corrosive. So these spots stay on the painting for say 10, 20, 50 years, they will gradually start to eat away the paint and can actually cause a hole through the paint layer. If, I, if you get to this early enough, you can remove them relatively easy. It doesn't cause any damage, but in the long term, they will damage an artwork. So here's a fun story, uh, Patrick Doherty and the Hatchlings. Uh, next time I see Patrick, I'm going to tell him I've got the perfect name for his band. I just thought this was a great name. But anyway, um, Patrick Doherty uh, is a North Carolina artist who has an international uh, uh, fame. He's, he's been building sculptures like these all over the world for the last few decades. And he's actually built at least three for the North Carolina Museum of Art. We see the one that we have now on the wall of the restaurant. Uh, it's a beautiful work that was made about 10 years ago. And I uh, hope you come and see it sometime. This is not the artwork that I'm getting ready to tell the story about. Patrick built a sculpture inside the old East building, oh, some 25 years ago, before my time, actually. And um, apparently it was winter time when he was building this sculpture. It's a very large sculpture, went up two or three floors within the, the body of the museum. And after it had been in the museum for, oh, a month or two, it hatched. And thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of small praying mantis hatched out of the sculpture and started running all over the museum. And of course, this was a little concerning to the staff and of course to our visitors as well. Um, fortunately, praying mantises don't eat art, they only eat insects. So we weren't concerned about the insects actually, uh, the, the praying mantis actually damaging the artwork, but they're protected species and we wanted to be nice to them. So as carefully as possible, we collected them. Many of the staff members went and collected the praying mantis and ushered them out the door. And I like to think that on the grounds of the North Carolina Museum of Art, we still have some, some, some progeny out there running around from these uh, uh, praying mantis that were born inside the museum. Here's a little mystery. Uh, we acquired this painting by Lee Mulliken. You see it on the left here, about a year ago, two years ago. This painting's about five feet tall. And if you look in the lower right, excuse me, lower left edge, here's a detail of it, you see these straight lines that the artist painted, then these kind of curious little, little marks. And these little marks, you only see them in a couple of places on the painting. I was always very curious about what this was. So when I was putting this talk together, I ran across a very interesting video. So I'm going to have to switch the screen here. Let's uh, see, how am I supposed to do this? Let's go back down here again. Oops, oh, I'm sorry, we've got to go back. Maybe we can't do this. Stop share. Um, I need to show a video. Can we do that? Yes. Do you have the, the video pulled up? I do. Share screen. Uh, here we go. Let's select the video. Make sure you click share, share computer sound. OK. I did not do that. Let's go back. Here we go. Share computer sound and optimize. We'll go back to it again. Share. There we go. So we're going to play about a minute of this. And you let me know if it is not working correctly. So we'll go large screen here. OK, here we go. In the 1980s, I worked on a project with Steven Spielberg and they asked me to have a fly walk through ink and leave fly footprints. I didn't know how to do it, so I experimented and I figured out how to make a fly walk through ink and leave fly footprints. This beetle is in the genus Elioides. 
the family Tenebrionidae. It's commonly known as a stink bug, and it's really a great walker. I use a water-based paint that's non-toxic, and I apply it to the ends of their legs, called the tarsi. When I apply it to the paper, you can see its footprints. It will drag its feet, and then as it walks along, the paint will diminish. Before I put him down on a wet piece of paper, I make sure that he has a good drink so that it's not going to take up any water with pigment in it. Now I'm going to guide him over to that center spot. I've found it fascinating to watch insects walk, how they can walk across ceilings and glass and sand and water. And I noticed different patterns. I started to notice that sometimes they would drag their feet. Sometimes insects would hop, skip, and jump. Now, you normally wouldn't notice this, but by putting pigment on their feet, it opens up a whole new world of walking. It leaves footprints that remain. And you OK, so there we go. We can return, return back to the talk. So mystery solved. Uh, do I need to uh, share the screen again, or are you doing that? I'm doing that, right? Yeah. I'm if sorry. you've if you've got it super handy, yeah. Yes, I'm, I I am, and I, I I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I uh, skipped out on that. There we go. So back to Steve. So what do we have here? We have an actual interspecies art collaboration. Certainly, Steve Kucher uh, uh, instigated this whole thing, but the bugs he couldn't have done it without the bugs. And here are three examples of paintings that he has created, and he's given the bugs um, uh, the credit here. Uh, on the far left, uh, someone's going to have to help me on the pronunciation of this one. Scarfidged, scarf, scarfid fly. I'm not even certain how to pronounce that one. Center in the middle, the uh, artwork in the center is by a monarch butterfly, and then down on the right, our favorite, the hissing cockroach, of course. So this, these are fantastic. I love these things. Uh, so let's go on to the next one: coloring with bugs. This is kind of an odd category. First step, uh, especially in the 19th century, but also still just a little bit today, we have people using the whole body of insects to create an art, or at least parts of them, like the wings. And you see an example of the insect that they might use, a jewel beetle at the top here. These are fantastically covered in colored insects, and, and they've been used through history to make some fantastic art. On the far left here, we see a, a Batistava uh, uh, made by a Japanese artist about 30, 40 years ago. And I'm told that it took him about five years to make this. And I think he used something upwards of eight or 10 different species of insect to create this. In the center, we have a 19th century dress in the collection of the uh, Victorian Albert Museum. And you can see in the detail the fantastic pattern that's been made with the insect wings here. And then at the, at the far right, we have Victorian jewelry. There's actually quite a bit of this Victorian jewelry that's made with actual insects. But there's a whole other category that I'm particularly enamored of, and that's making paint out of insects. And this goes way, way back. Um, the lac beetle in, uh, in India, originally from India, makes these casings very much like a, a praying mantis case, but they, they uh, exude this resin, which they lay their eggs in. And this is harvested by people to make shellac, a, a resin. And you see an example of that to the left here. But you also, excuse me, have the, the insects themselves, the insect larvae, which are very bright red. And if you isolate that from, from the egg casing here, you have this fantastic dye pigment. And this has been used since old master times and before, probably from, since the Roman Empire, just about. Then you also have kermes or carmine. This is an insect that proliferates around the Mediterranean, particularly on the European side of the Mediterranean. It grows on or lives on oak trees, Mediterranean oak trees. And during the uh, medieval period, this was one of the prime sources of a red pigment. In fact, it goes way back to Roman times. I've been told that the Spanish provinces of the Roman Empire paid their taxes to Rome in kermes. That's how, how important this was. So you can see the actual living insect here on the upper left, and it looks kind of like an olive sticking on the side of the tree. And in fact, for the longest time, people thought this was actually a berry. They didn't realize it was an insect at all. Uh, but it makes a fantastic red. And you can see that on one of our artworks at the North Carolina Museum of Art, actually many of our artworks at the, at the Art Museum. But here in particular, you see it in the red shadowing 
on this angel. And then, of course, my favorite and a lot of people's favorites, cochineal. Cochineal is a New World insect, very similar to the Old World Kermes, but in other ways very different. The, uh, the Spanish, when they, when they discovered the New World, uh, found, found cochineal. It's interesting, the Spanish were very uh, uh, focused on finding something that would make them rich, which was generally gold and silver. But in the long run, cochineal was almost as profitable for the Spanish. They had a monopoly on cochineal for about three centuries. Uh, the Native Americans had been using cochineal for close to 1500 years, both to dye textiles as well as to make paint and other things. And that's what we uh, pointed this out earlier, our Peruvian textile from 1500 years ago. The reds here are almost certainly from cochineal dye. And also from the North Carolina Museum of Art, you have a beautiful uh, Paolo Veronese painting with this deep purplish red, and this is almost certainly the cochineal dye. Now, interestingly enough, this is very much in demand today as well for slightly different reasons. It's almost everything that we eat and drink and, and put on our face that has a red color in it. Uh, cochineal is, I think, the only uh, red dye that's uh, okayed by the uh, Food and Drug Administration for use in these types of things. So here's my last couple of slides. What's buggy about these paintings? Let's think about this for a minute. Um, they're ra rather large. These are about 10 years old, I believe, maybe 15 years old. And these are three large paintings by John New. And I really couldn't believe it when I saw this. I discovered this just recently doing this research. And once again, we're going to look at a video. So let's stop sharing this screen and go back to the, uh, uh, the videos once again. Let's see. Let's go to, uh, where'd my videos go? There it is. We're going to do a different video. Whoops. I've got to change this. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's do this. Yes. Do this. Yes, yes. Here we go. Now we're going to watch about a minute of this one as well. And you will see that our friends, the flies, are involved once again. I just love that part at the end, the sound of the flies um, uh, <laughs> running, running around there. Um, let's go back to my talk once again. Here we are. So mystery solved here as well. The flies, once again, we have an interspecies collaboration. Uh, John Newth uses the flies to apply paint to his paintings. Now, how does he do this? Well, as we talked about before, the flies vomit their digestive juices onto the surface. So he actually feeds them paint. He, he's feeding them sugar water with pigment in it. The flies ingest this, and then he puts them in proximity of a canvas, and the flies congregate on the painting, uh, on the canvas, and regurgitate their pigment onto the painting. So I can't think of a more disgusting way to make a painting. Well, maybe I can think of a more disgusting way, but it is pretty disgusting. But it makes a really interesting painting, and he's made a lot of these. And I, I hope he and the flies are continuing to do well with their artistic endeavor. So I think that's the last. Yes, this is that was my last slide. I'll leave you with a couple of far side images and uh, a great comic art, cartoon art by Gary Larson. And I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. I'll stop the share. Excellent, excellent. How interesting. I love all the different ways that you found to bring art and insects together. <laughs> like wow. art of insects, insects doing art. I can't take credit for it. The, bug, the bugs are the stars today and the bugs are what I focused on, but they did it. They contributed their bodies. They did the damage. They did it all. They, they did the inspiration. It wasn't me. I just pointed it out. <laughs>
Uh, I'll remind everybody watching, leave your thoughts and your questions for our guest speaker there in the chat box off to the side on YouTube. And uh, I'll grab those questions and pose them here uh, on the live stream. So get into the chat box, everybody. But I'm a little curious, how do you clean up fly specs? Fly specs, uh, if they are nice and fresh, uh, we clean them off with water, basically. Uh, uh, spit, saliva is one of our favorite cleaning agents in the conservation world, and it works quite well if the fly specs are fresh. But if they're not fresh, if they've been on there quite a while, like I said, they're corrosive, and they will slowly but surely kind of burn through the surface and down into the paint. So in a lot of cases, especially a painting as old as the one I showed you, which was about 170 years old, um, the fresher fly specs came off, the older ones made holes, which I had to compensate for with, with my retouching that we often do with restoration. So tell me a little bit more about uh, some of the artworks that you have restored and the insect damage that you've seen. Uh, well, fortunately with the paint, as, as a painting conservator, most of the things I've dealt with have been very surface issues like fly specs, that sort of thing. Every once in a while we see you know, some other insect kind of um, uh, uh, interaction. I've, I've worked on paintings where the back of the painting has had a mud dauber nests. The, the paintings weren't stored very well. They were put in a barn or something like that. And the mud daubers had discovered it and thought the back of the canvas would be a fantastic place to put a nice, uh, you know, clay, dirt, plaster kind of nest. And, in, and for the most part, it would be relatively benign, except it acts like a sponge and absorbs moisture. And that tends to pop the paint off on the front of the painting. So in these cases, I've had damaged the exact shape of that uh, a mud dauber nest on the front of the painting. One other thing I thought was really interesting, I did a short stint in Hawaii. I, I only worked there for about four weeks on a contract. And I worked with in a department with several other conservators, particularly objects conservators. And one of them was from the States. And he told me something really interesting. He said in the States, there, there's you know half a dozen insects that we worry about. The ones I presented today are pretty much the only ones we have to worry about. He said in Hawaii, there's probably three times as many insects in Hawaii that, that will consume materials and artworks. And they're essentially the same insects that we have anywhere else in the world, and it's including the United States. But for some reason in that tropical environment, the insects are much worse, even ones that are relatively innocent elsewhere. Interesting, interesting stuff. All right, let's see. Uh, let me take a look at the chat here. Carol has a question. Is there any risk with the insects carrying and transmitting pathogens? Uh, yeah, I guess that is actually possible. Um, um, painting conservators don't generally worry about that too. Gloves and a respirator if we're in an environment where we think it might be a problem, but in objects conservation and other things, there are many, many stories of pathogens that have been preserved for years, hundreds of years, in the, in the um, uh, context of the artwork, in the matrix of the artwork. And those things are just waiting for human contact. Um, at the, uh, I just recently heard of uh, a World War I exhibit where the conservator had been treating objects before they went on view. And one of those objects, uh, the, the artist, or excuse me, one of the uh, uh, people that associated with treating the object, I believe they contracted trench foot. Oh, so, so it, you know, it, it is something that we have to be worried about. The other thing that often happens is the things that we use to uh, discourage insects are a problem. Oftentimes, you still see this today, but it was very bad a century or so ago. Objects that were going to go into a museum collection, they would be saturated with insecticides and things to kill insects and to keep insects away. And oftentimes these materials had mercury in them, arsenic, things like that. They were extremely toxic. So now if we as conservators or museum workers or anybody else come in contact with those objects, of course, they're a risk to us. And that, that's, that's a serious problem. Right. Perry, I think we lost your video feed. You might want to turn oh, okay. your camera off and back on and see if we get you back. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. But you've 
frozen. Yeah, on I see your that it is not. It's not uh, stopping the video as it normally would. It's I've got a little spinning wheel telling me it's trying to do it, but it's not doing it. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, I'm got, glad to continue talking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's more great questions coming up here too. So Julie is curious, sure. how do you feel about farm raised insects for art? For example, butterfly wings used in art. Well, you know, it gets into kind of dicey territory to tell you the truth. I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of person, personally, I'm just speaking for myself. Personally, I'm the kind of person that you know, I'm not interested in wearing furs or uh, I, I tend to be somewhat of a vegetarian, although I do still eat meat. And some more of that's, most of that's on kind of moral issues. Um, but at the same time, the natural world is just full of things that are inspirational and, and beautiful materials in themselves, which you can't replicate in a lot of other ways. I think that, you know, if, you, if you're farm raising insects, the insects are gonna die naturally anyway, maybe using those materials, it's okay. One of the things I thought was really interesting about um, the two artists that we talked about who, who interact with insects to make uh, their artworks, uh, both of those uh, uh, artists commented about being concerned about their insects. They wanted to make them safe. So we saw in the first video of, of the artist uh, applying paint to the legs of the artist, he was very careful to make it a water-based paint that was easily removable. If he caught it, he said he also gave the bugs a drink before they were dipped in paint and put on the paper just so they wouldn't stop and drink uh, the water that might have paint on it from the surface of the painting. And as well, the, uh, the artist that works with flies, he, uh, he went so far as to uh, talk with an entomologist friend of his to make sure his, his flies were happy and that he wasn't being mean to the flies in some way. And he said, the, fly, the entomologist said, the flies appear to be happy. They're reproducing, they're busy, they're eating. They're doing what flies do. So apparently that was okay. Good to hear, good to hear. Uh, how, how do flies get royalties off of the artwork? <laughs> I don't know. I hope, hopefully on their off days they're being fed something nice, you know, uh, you know whatever flies like. More disgusting <laughs> the better maybe. But uh, yeah, I hope, he, I hope he's being nice to his flies. All right, Katie's question is, would you still consider displaying something like the statue that had been hollowed out by insect damage or would it be considered too unstable? That's a good question. Very good question. We do exhibit that sculpture. It's a fantastic sculpture. That artist is very well known, particularly in Europe. Fantastic artwork. And we, we of course, would like to put that on view and have it on view. But we have to worry about things being too unstable. There are artworks in our collection and elsewhere in everybody's collection that become so sensitive that you can't put them on view very easily. We can take um, uh, precautionary steps. You'll see if you come to the museum, quite a few artworks are in what we call vitrines. They're on a case, but they also have a clear plastic uh, or, or plexiglass uh, case put over top of them so nothing can actually touch them. And that, that might be a step that we would take for something that was even more fragile. But in the case of that wooden sculpture, it is strong enough and we are able to do armatures and clips and things that keep it in place and it's not in danger of being touched and things like that. It's not that vulnerable. And then a follow-up question, what restorative action could be taken? Uh, for that particular sculpture? Well, mm -hmm. I'm not an objects conservator, so I'm, I'm going out on a limb here a little bit. There have been cases where resins, uh, uh, good archival conservation grade resins and things have been put into cavities created by insects to strengthen the, uh, the overall structure. In some cases, that has worked out very well. In other cases, not so much. Every time, one thing about conservation is we don't wanna introduce materials unless we absolutely have to because we've, we've learned through time that when you add something to an artwork, say retouching or glue or any number of things like that, oftentimes it backfires. 20, 30, 50 years later, that material has its own problem. So we try not to interject, uh, put any more materials into an object than absolutely necessary. Um, the the X-ray image of the painting is kind of interesting in that the reason you can see the tunnels so well is because they have paint in them. 
that board, the board was actually bug eaten before the artist used it in the 17th century. Uh, apparently, wooden boards are so uh, uh, highly thought of, even a damaged one is used by the artist. So in this case, the artist or the preparator for the artist actually put the ground material on there, which happens to have lead white in it, uh, put the ground materials on there, prepared the panel, and the tunnels of the um, uh, insect damage actually sucked in some of that paint. So the white lead in those tunnels makes it very visible in an x-ray. That's why we can see it so well. Great questions all around. Uh, let's see. OK, there are people who, oh, here's a great question. There are people who are loving the questions that are coming in, too. So it's, <laughs> it's a cool conversation happening over here where they're complimenting each other on their great questions. I'm glad we have such a positive bug and science community and art community. <laughs> Okay, Marianne is asking, does climate change affect artwork? Oh, it's going, it, it will have to. I mean, I think climate change is affecting everything, good, bad, or in between, and I guess for the most part, bad. Um, the one thing I can think of is that very similar to the Hawaii situation, as environments change, uh, insects will move. Uh, if we're talking specifically about insect damage and art interaction, um, insects will move. So insects that we are used to now, that we know how to deal with, um, those insects will move. They might be pushed aside by new insects that come into our area because our climate has changed. Insects that we're not really expecting. And so that, that could easily cause damage that we're not aware of before it's already happened. So that's something we have to stay very vigilant about. Um, that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. What about insects in particular? I'm more sorry. insects. Marianne's asking more insects or different types of insects that might be uh, better it, suited to higher temperatures or humidity. Yeah, they're different types is what I'd be concerned about. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, referring to the Hawaii situation, you have a very tropical environment there. You don't get uh, the extreme cold uh, that a lot of our environments get to, to kill off insects, to, to re reduce their life cycle, to keep their numbers down, that sort of thing. So you have a very benign environment like in Hawaii for a lot of insects, that, that doesn't happen. That cycle doesn't happen. They, they just keep growing in numbers and variety and competition uh, as far as what they eat and whatnot. And, and now that I think of it, maybe that's part of it. Maybe the competition with other insects is what's driving them to eat things they wouldn't ordinarily eat. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've actually done lots of reading and research on climate change and I wouldn't have thought about how specifically artworks like this, right? How, how human culture is preserved and then could, could face a demise under climate change scenarios. That's sure, interesting absolutely. to think about. Uh, a cautionary tale. One of the things that's incredible about Egyptian art, ancient Egyptian art, and the reason that we still have it is because of their tomb culture, their funeral culture things that they valued in life, they put into the ground, into a tomb. And the tomb was very protected. Uh, a lot of these are underground in uh, the arid areas of Egypt. And so we're talking about an environment that's relatively inhospitable to anything else. So you wouldn't have a lot of insect interaction, damaging insect interaction in the tombs of, of, of the ancient Egyptians. You take those art objects out like we have in so many cases and take them to other parts of the world. Well, the other parts of the world have insects that the ancient Egyptians never would have known. And their objects become very tasty to the local uh, insects. So it, that's sort of the same kind of problem that we might see with climate change and the, the change of insects moving into different environments in different regions. A user here wants to know, is there a type of bug that makes artwork without human help? Hmm, well, no. uh, I guess that depends on your definition of artwork. I have a very wide definition of art. To me, art is basically anything that's man-made, excuse me, people-made, human-made. Um, and that can be food, it can be dance, it can be music, it can be literature, it can be just about anything that's made uh, uh, by human hands. Uh, if you go by that definition, then I guess anything that's made by an insect is not art. But then maybe the art is in the eye of the beholder. Maybe insects would see it as art themselves. Um, it, it's really hard to say. We see 
I see, we see things in the natural environment all the time that are incredibly beautiful. Things that, um, you know, you could say were not consciously made by the environment, by insects or, or any other kind of natural force, but we can still call them art. I think we do still call them art. So in that sense, yeah, I think insects can make some beautiful things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of my favorites, uh, they're called caddisflies. Caddisfly larvae, I believe that's right, caddisfly larvae uh, build these protective shells around their bodies with anything that they find in the environment. And uh, sometimes they, I, I don't know, they seem to be pretty creative with what they use to build uh, out of their stuff. Of course, there are, are artists who have used caddisflies and given them like gold leaf and gems, and they build these very ornate uh, little houses for themselves out of that stuff too. But um, that sounds fantastic, Chris. Maybe you can identify the bug I'm thinking of in my backyard here in, in Raleigh. Every once in a while, I'll notice a little tiny speck moving, and it just looks like a uh, lichen or something like that. So I'm thinking that, excuse me, in the in the case of your caddisfly, it's some kind of an insect that has decorated itself, camouflaged itself with materials. Um, so so yeah, along that same line. You know, there's a, there are actually quite a few creatures that do similar things like that. Um, I'd have to see a picture probably. Maybe some of the naturalist experts who are probably watching the show right now, they may know exactly what you're seeing. <laughs> uh, let's see, one last question here that was, came up earlier in the show. Did they use molds to make the insect weights? Uh, probably. Uh, I, I, I can't say specifically because I'm not an expert on these objects, but generally speaking, sculptures that are made out of metal, and these are made out of a copper kind of alloy like brass or bronze, they frequently start as a mold, uh, a, a maybe a relatively simplified mold. And that makes the, 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 the main object maybe 80, 90% of, of what you see. And then once it comes out of the mold, then they hand tool the surface to give it more definition and detail and get rid of the rough marks and things like that. So, so probably saying it came from a mold is, is very accurate, but I think there's probably more to the artistic quality of, of making that than just popping it out of a mold. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and a dragonfly woman over here on YouTube says that the thing in your backyard is a lacewing larva. A lacewing? Lacewing. Lacewing, excellent. Thank you very much. Lacewing larva. Thanks everybody. Look at this great science art community. <laughs> We've already put it together already. Well, Perry, thank you so much for being part of the Lunchtime Discovery Series and Bugfest today. Absolutely, thank you very much. It was a great opportunity. And like I said, I, I learned so much just putting together this talk and I'm really happy to be able to relate it to people out there. And everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, to the folks who had the, that I gave the wrong link to, uh, my apologies. I'm glad that you were able to jump over and find us. And thanks to the folks at the Office of Environmental Education for their help putting on the Lunchtime Discovery Series every week, doing a lot of the legwork. Thanks to the digital media team at the museum for bringing us this show every Wednesday at noon. It means we'll be back here next Wednesday at noon with another program. Visit uh, naturalsciences.org or look for the Office of Environmental Education's website. You can also follow everybody on Twitter. We're at Natural Sciences and then North Carolina EE is the Environmental Education Office's Twitter as well. Uh, Perry, the Museum of Art has reopened uh, and opened back up to the public now too, right? We, ha we have, we opened up about a week ago, I think exactly. And we're enjoying quite a few numbers. Uh, we have all the safety uh, um, uh, situation you could possibly want as far as COVID situation. Uh, and I've been there over there myself. It's, it's, it's really nice to have the museum back open. The energy that our visitors give is wonderful. And uh, just to see people in the building enjoying it again, absolutely, it's a great thing. I will say that the park never closed. And the park, of course, mm -hmm. is where you can find many happy insects. We hope you don't find them in the art museum. But the park is a great place to observe insects. So come on out. <laughs> Absolutely. That's one thing that I love about uh, Museum of Art and the, you know, having the Museum of Art as a sister institution within the state government to the Museum of Natural Sciences is that we both have these 
this great push to get people outdoors in some fresh air and in some nature. You folks do it with a little bit of artistic flair and we do it by telling people about plants and animals. But uh, I think it works out really well. Absolutely. It's, all, it's always nice to partner up on just about anything. So, so please give us a call again. We, we love doing this sort of thing. And, and we've, we've uh, and vice versa, we've done similar things with you before. We have a great Audubon exhibition. Uh, and unfortunately, it's changed since a few years back. But for a while there, we had quite a few um, birds, actual birds that we had borrowed from the Natural Science Museum to augment our Audubon collection. So we're looking forward to doing more things like that. Sounds great. I'll remind everybody watching too, uh, visit naturalsciences.org in order to see information about our museum in downtown Raleigh. We are opening our doors September 22nd, next Tuesday. You can get free timed reservations at naturalsciences.org and we'll be very excited to welcome you into the Science Museum in Raleigh as well. So, Chris, Thank you very uh, much, everybody. Chris, Go ahead. Can I, can I just mention again? Yeah, it's the same thing for the art museum. We ask that people uh, uh, communicate through the internet in advance for free entry tickets, timed entry tickets. Thank you. Of course, of course. All right, uh, everybody, naturalsciences.org for our open information, bugfest.org to sign up for more Bugfest programming. There's a lot more happening over the next few days all the way through Saturday. So I hope I'll see you again real soon. Take care. Stay safe. We'll see you again real soon. Bye, everybody.